Hey, welcome everybody to the, uh, the monthly MDSA infrastructure interest group meeting. Um, it's great to have everybody here. And uh, if you could add your name to the uh, attendance list, uh, that'd be great. And the, uh, the running notes document, uh, let us know if you don't have a link to that document. We added it a couple times on, um, in the chat on Zoom, but uh, you may or may not be able to see it. And it looks like uh, we have um, a new member here. Um, Kim, I was wondering if maybe you could uh, give us a, a quick introduction, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, hi, uh, my name is Kim Jane Francisco. Um, I am recently the new digital preservation librarian at Vassar College. Um, so this is a, a newly established position for Vassar. Um, previously, I was the uh, processing and digital archivist at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Um, I got out of Texas at just the right time. <laughs> um, and I'm uh, excited to be here. Great, great, well, welcome. welcome. So um, as a, a brief introduction, I'm, I'm Eric Lowe Patton, uh, one of the co-chairs, and uh, this is Leah Prescott, uh, the other co-chair. She's been, well, you've been here working and running this meeting for a year plus now, right? A year, yeah, just a little over a year, so yeah. Okay. I, I'm the newer newer of the two co-chairs, so, um, but we've, I think we've, uh, <clears throat> we've got this year planned, uh, you know, going pretty well underway. Um, you know, it was, uh, uh, we appreciate everybody putting together or, or adding information or ideas to the poll that we put out in terms of, um, uh, possible topics for uh, our meetings for the upcoming year. Um, so we've got a lot of great possibilities there. Um, but uh, let's see, for today, um, this meeting is going to mainly focus on uh, three brief talks in um, uh, one after the other with some questions in between if you want to, or we'll save the questions at the end, all about um, fixity in the cloud. Uh, so we have, um, Andrew Diamond at AP Trust is here. He will be uh, talking for about 10 minutes so, or so about their system. Um, then I'll talk about uh, the way Merit handles Fixity in the cloud. And then uh, Leo will be talking a little bit, little bit about how they handle Fixity in the cloud at uh, Georgetown. Um, but before we get started with that, um, we did want to mention uh, a couple things about two of the surveys that the NDSA uh, we'll be uh, working to put together. So um, Leah, do you wanna chat about those for a minute? Yeah, so leadership group has been talking about um, looking at the various uh, reports and surveys that the NDSA has put out over the past few years and uh, updating some of them. And two proposals are in the works. They haven't gone all the way through yet, but just to give you a uh, heads up that these are potentially coming. And one is the staffing survey uh, that was last done, I think in 2017, it was done in 2012 and 2017. And uh, this is basically a survey of organizations who are, uh, who have digital content. With, and um, it's, it's really about trying to determine scaling up digital preservation programs, and staffing, scoping, and organizational decisions, uh, such as how many staff are needed and what kinds of skills, education, and experience should they have? Uh, what types of positions should the institution create? Should it hire new staff or retrain existing staff? And how should the preservation program be scoped? That is, what functions should be included directly in the program provided by other parts of the organization, outsourced or implemented through collaboration with other organizations? and what organizational and staffing models work well. So that was from the last survey uh, that was part of their sort of executive overview. And there may be people here who actually were part of the staffing survey last time. I think the general thought is that we in interest groups, you know, talk, talk about the process of doing something like this survey, but that the survey itself will be done within a separate working group that will be created um, so think about whether that's something that you're interested in, uh, in terms of a working group, and then you'll be ready uh, if and when the proposal is um, approved and accepted. 
And then the other one is the fixity survey, which again, I think the last year it was done was in 2017. And this is really just doing a survey of institutions to determine what strategies that they're that they're using to do fixity, you know, down to what algorithms are they using, uh, what are the challenges that uh, they face when implementing a fixity routine, you know, how are you doing it, how often are you doing it, uh, do you plan to do it, um, and then, like I said, basically what practices you're using. Um, that was in 2017. I suspect that based on what we're going to be talking about today, cloud computing and fixity in the cloud, that this survey maybe will have additional data points. I'm not sure. But anyway, again, this is another proposal um, that would uh, the survey would be implemented by a working group. So think about if that's something you're interested in. And then when the call goes out, um, you'll be ready. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Leah. So um, we've got three, uh, like 10 or so minute talks lined up. Um, I would in, encourage folks to, if you, if you have any questions, like right after a talk ends, if you have any like questions you really want to ask right then, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, otherwise we will uh, probably uh, have a, just um, maybe 10 or 15 minutes after all three of the presentations uh, that should serve as time for questions and discussion. So. Um, with that, um, Andrew, uh, I was wondering if you could take it away. Let us know if you can share your screen. Put this link in here because I wrote up some notes for this talk. And when I share my screen, I'm basically just sharing that same document. Great. Um, so I actually started putting together these notes uh, a couple weeks ago when someone had posted to the NDSA mailing list um, a question about cloud fixity. Um, and just for background, AP Trust maintains um, several million files in cloud preservation. It's all in AWS at the moment. Uh, in S3 and Glacier, we'll be expanding to Wasabi as well soon. But um, we've been doing fixity checks on these items since 2014 or so. Um, on the S3 items, not on the Glacier items. Um, and we check everything in S3 every 90 days. Um, so I'll go through these notes and, and talk about some of the things we learned and why we do things the way we do. And starting out, um, a traditional uh, reason for fixity checking is to check for bit rot. And that was um, you know, that's basically like your your hard drive going bad or um, something generally like hardware or tape corruption. Um, that's not so much an issue anymore with cloud providers. They tend to um, have systems in place to know ahead of time when hardware is failing. They take provisions to uh, make new copies of the files that were on that failing hardware. So um, that is, is often taken care of for you. And I'll get into that just a little bit more below. Um, second reason for fixity checking is to look for malicious file corruption. I think that's rare in a lot of environments, but um, there are times when you have to check for it, um, especially if it's maybe politically sensitive materials or things that people have some motivation to, to alter or corrupt. And uh, the last reason, which I think is a really big one actually, is to check for accidental file corruption. Um, I think some of you at this meeting were at the Library of Congress Preservation Summit a few years ago when they talked about um, kind of their alarm at finding some of their internal files and in preservation appeared to be corrupted because uh, the checksums didn't match. And when they dug into it, they actually found out that um, there was one system that was updating some of these files and not telling their registry that the checksums had changed. Um, 
We here at AP Trust, actually the only fixity failures we've ever had on our cloud storage uh, were due to um, me trying to clean up a mess very early on in our few months, first few months of operation. We had, um, it's a long technical story, but we had ingested a number of things multiple times. Um, I identified duplicates, tried to get rid of them. And what I found was that um, I had actually in a few cases deleted a newer version of a file that was, that had been legitimately duplicated. Um, so the Fixity checks found that for us and actually caused us to uh, implement a new policy where even we internally at AP Trust, even our administrators can't delete things without review and consent from a depositor, which I think is a generally good system to have in place if, if you're holding materials that belong to others. So going back to these reasons for fixity checking in the cloud, Amazon and these other service providers, uh, they take their own internal fixity, which they may not share with you um, when you put an object into their storage. And they, I believe are consistently doing internal audits. As I've mentioned, they have systems that warn them of impending hardware failures. They do checks that, um, I believe check the actual storage blocks, not necessarily files. And um, when they detect that storage blocks on their hardware devices are going bad, they can figure out what files or pieces of files are stored on those blocks and they will make new copies of them. They also, when doing random checks, um, S3 typically keeps three copies of every file you store with them. And when doing random checks, if they find a bad copy, something where the checksum doesn't match up, they'll overwrite it with one of the two remaining good copies. And that's how they get to this um, durability guarantee of 99.999%. Um, so that, that's a sort of built-in fixity check that you get with uh, just, just by going with a cloud storage provider. It does not, however, they, they generally don't provide transparency. They cannot tell you, yes, we checked these files on this date and here are the checksums that we came up with using the SHA-256 algorithm. I don't think they use those algorithms internally and they don't share that information with you. I, I don't think any cloud provider does. So when they say that your stuff is still there and intact, um, you have to take their word for it. Um, and their word is generally good. It's like good 99.999% of the time. And that's more than you can say of most people and organizations in this world. But if you have to turn around to some stakeholder who, who says, you tell me for sure that my stuff is still there and intact. Um, you can't go say to them, well, here are the checksums. I ran them yesterday myself um, or Amazon ran them yesterday. Uh, the storage providers don't give you that. Um, Amazon came to uh, a couple of those storage preservation, preservation storage summits at the Library of Congress. And they, they did a really good job of asking questions and listening to what are the needs of um, these digital preservation archives. And um, they understood you know, that, that many of us have to actually be able to take a fixity check at a certain time and be able to turn around and say to a stakeholder, yes, it's there, this is the fixity and it does match what it was two years ago. So we know it's still good. Um, Amazon did come up with uh, what they call this serverless fixity for digital preservation compliance. And um, it's a really, actually on the technical side, the implementation is really interesting because um, when you're, so Amazon serverless functions called Lambda functions, 
um, are lightweight. They can spin up and run at any time on any server, perform a quick task, and save their output to somewhere else where you can retrieve it. But they have this limitation that they can only run for five minutes at max. And um, that has prevented people from ever using them for fixity checking, because when you're checking a file that's like 500 gigabytes, there's just no way in the world to get that done in five minutes. So that AWS team internally came up with this pretty cool system where um, you know, most of your fixity checks will run in under five minutes uh, because most of your files aren't that huge. But when you do run across these huge files, they um, created this system where the five minute function actually hands off the work that it's managed to complete in this huge fixity check to the next five minute function. And there are cases where um, if it takes an hour to, to check an entire file, it'll be 12 functions in a row handing off their work to each other. And the last one has the final output, the fixity. So that system that they put together does allow you to, to perform fixity on any file stored in S3. And you can do it on a schedule or you can do it on demand. Um, the kind of downside of it is that because it's a Lambda function, you pay by the millisecond for how long it takes to calculate that fixity uh, on, on every file. And so you can't really know if, um, say you wanna run scheduled fixities every 30 days, it's gonna be hard for you to predict what your costs are. Um, and it obvious, the costs obviously go up incrementally as your amount of storage goes up. So it is a, a pretty cool solution and um, it may be useful to you in some cases, or you may find it, it doesn't quite serve your case, but it's worth looking into. Google Cloud Storage uh, came up with a similar, um, a similar system where you don't need to run your own server to run fixity checks on items that you've stored in GCS. Um, but their system has some limitations as well. It only calculates MD5 checksums and it does expect your files and objects to be stored in Bagot format, um, actually looking like a directory, right? You know, with um, a root directory and then a manifest file and then a data directory and the payload files inside that data directory. It, it works on the assumption that that is how you have stored your materials. So, you know, if you're using Google Cloud and MD5 checksums are suitable and you are storing in Bagot, that is a good solution for you. Um, AP Trust, uh, we run our own fixity checks. We have the fixity checker running as a background process around the clock on some of our servers and uh, our workloads for ingest and restoration and things like that are, um, we have periods of the day that are busy and long periods of the day that are not busy. So that fixity checker running in the background often has access to lots of network bandwidth and lots of memory and CPU when the rest of the system isn't working that hard. We run uh, the fixity checker in the same data center as the S3 bucket that we're going to be checking. Um, and that makes it fast because the network retrieval is very quick in the same data center. And it also ensures that we're not paying any costs for data egress or moving the data from one AWS region to another. Um, it also allows us to calculate fixity based on uh, any algorithms we want. And up until recently, we've supported just MD5 and SHA-256. Um, going forward, as we begin to support the BTR beyond the repository Bagot format, um, that Bagot format specifically allows other algorithms such as SHA-512 and SHA-1 
And if we're getting materials where the depositor gives us checksums with that algorithm, then we want to be able to um, check going forward that we want our digest to, to match those algorithms so that we can say to them, yeah, that's, it's still what you gave us. So uh, one, one other nice thing about cloud storage is that it uh, allows you to store um, random metadata tags or arbitrary metadata tags with your objects. And um, we tend to use those metadata tags among other things to store information about the, uh, the correct known fixity digest for each, for each file. Um, yeah, so that's, those are the basics that I wanted to walk through. And um, if you guys have any questions about what we're doing or why or what other options are out there, you know, let me know. Do folks um, have any questions for Andrew? I mean, I think my my big question is, and I was telling Eric this before the meeting was, <clears throat> you know, when when have fixity issues occurred in the past? So it was great to have you kind of share what your experience has been with that over time. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting in that you you may set up fixity checking thinking that it's going to alert you to problems in your hardware. And then you find out it actually alerts you to some problems in your process. Um, and either way, you know, those are things you want to know. Yeah, one, um, I, when I go through uh, a quick presentation also, I'll, I'll be mentioning something similar like that where we ended up detecting an issue um, that was actually not part of our process, but part of the process that was at um, SDSC, the, the cloud storage provider. Um, so, but I, I was curious um, with regard to the new solution that AWS has uh, with regard to being able to, you know, run your own fixity by using Lambda functions. Uh, I, I think, you know, what you pointed out there uh, was, you know, really, really critical in terms of being able to determine how much money you're going to be spending on running those Lambda functions based on the content that's going through. And it, that would just be a, a really, really difficult <laughs> equation to, to try to conquer there or to, to try to kind of, um, you know, wrap your head around. Um, I, is, have, you, have you all thought of using that or have you kind of hit that, hit that big question and, and backed away from it or just curious? Um. When we thought of, when we first looked at Lambda functions, we just, we knew out of hand, we couldn't use them because of that five minute limit. That was before um, AWS released their, um, their internal solution for this. Um, when, so there's a question in the chat, like how do we do cost estimation? Is there a rule of thumb for cost per terabyte on top of basic S3 storage rates? So one of the reasons we we still don't use the Lambda functions is because when we run these fixity checks on um, reserved S3 instances, we already know ahead of the time, ahead of time for the year, what we're paying for that instance. And the fixity check is basically free running on there. The way we do it, we, we pull the file from S3 and send it uh, it de never goes to disk. We just send it to dev null, which means it never gets written anywhere. But we can calculate the fixity on the stream as it passes through, which is extremely fast. And it doesn't incur any cost for us because we're pulling the file from the same data center that our server's in. We're not writing it to any disk, so it's not using any storage there. So it winds up being fast and efficient and, and basically free on this instance that we've already paid for. And it most of these checks run in what's otherwise idle time when other services aren't, aren't busy. And we're able to do quite a number of them. Um, sorry, I have another question. What are our plans for Wasabi? 
we have um, on our staging system, we're already using Wasabi's data centers in Virginia and Oregon. Their cost for storage is similar to Glacier, um, but it's much easier and faster to get materials back from Wasabi. And there's no charge for getting materials back. So those are two big pluses. Um, we, so we're bringing them on partly for the, for the cost benefit, but also partly because our depositors want um, variety in the vendors. So they're, they're not storing all of their materials with a single vendor. Wasabi also gives us some technological diversity. Um, geographically, their data centers are sort of in the same regions as Amazon's and, um, and Amazon's data centers in Virginia and Oregon. But um, we will probably offer them as a, as a mix and match solution so that some depositors may want to put a copy of their materials in AWS storage in Virginia and um, Wasabi storage in Oregon. That's the most likely case that I see. Um, sorry, there's one more in there's, chat. Yep, yeah, from Joe. Um, yeah. Is there a fixity checking strategy for content stored in Glacier? Uh, the answer to that is no. We, um, we actually looked into this when AP Trust was a deepen node because all of the deepen materials were in Glacier. And at the time, though Amazon is, has eased up since then on its cost and restrictiveness for, um, for pulling Glacier data. At the time, it was absolutely untenable um, because Amazon started hitting you with these huge penalties if you pulled more than 5% of your contents out of Glacier in a single year or a single month. Um, I think they've dropped that, that penalty. Um, they've made it easier to pull stuff out and less expensive, but there still is a cost. And when we do the numbers on that cost, Glacier, with us doing regular fixity checks, winds up being as expensive or slightly more expensive than S3. And that's not why people are putting materials there. Our, they, they're putting stuff there because it's cheap. And our current standard storage option is um, one copy goes into S3 in Virginia and one copy goes into Glacier in Oregon. So that provides geographic and technological um, diversity. Um, and our, our current guarantee to depositors is that we do fixity checks on the S3 stuff and not on the Glacier stuff. Um, we do have a few depositors putting materials in Glacier only and um, you know, there's we've said this explicitly, and I think our depositors understand it. That's like your third or fourth like copy of last resort um, because it's not going to get checked, um, and you're trusting solely to Amazon's uh, durability guarantees on those copies. Great. Well, thank you, Andrew. Much appreciated. Sure. Thanks for going through all that. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions as well. And we're at about 35 after. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well. So uh, run this presentation. Um, So can folks see this browser window here? Okay. Yep. Uh, great, thanks. Zoom as usual is uh, presenting its challenges. So, all right, well, I think um, at, uh, at California Digital Library at CDL, we have uh, a, lot of, a, lot of a lot of similarities going on um, in terms of how our system uh, is working. Um, it'll be uh, interesting to 
compare and contrast. Um, so our, our system, uh, our preservation repository at CDL is called Merit. Um, and I think uh, some folks here are familiar with it. Um, but as a, as a quick overview, uh, Merit is running as a series of microservices, uh, nine of them across a whole series of uh, servers. Some of those are, or all of them are high availability. Um, so in other words, we have some microservices um, running on you know, two, three or four uh, boxes at a time. Um, we have about uh, 165 terabytes worth of content and around 53 million files. Uh, and we're also, for any given collection, um, we're working with three different copies. Uh, so our, our general policy uh, to anybody who is depositing in Merit um, is that they'll have three copies of, of each of the objects um, and they're geographically distributed um, both on the East Coast uh, at Wasabi's data center there and Manassas, Virginia. Uh, on, in Oregon, uh, just like with APTRUST uh, in, in AWS there. Um, and then we have uh, another copy in, um, in San Diego at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, um, which often actually serves as the primary copy for a lot of our collections. Uh, so the system as a whole, the different um, services are running all the common tasks that you would think about, uh, including ingest and storage and the front end and all that sort of thing. Um, the way Merit is put together uh, at the moment in terms of its use of uh, cloud providers uh, for storage are um, the online copies are either in S3 uh, in Cumulo, which is uh, at San Diego Supercomputer Center. It's uh, what they call their um, <clears throat> universal storage. And then we have, we actually brought copies of um, our objects into Wasabi starting about half a year ago. Um, and we've, you know, we basically migrated everything to Wasabi to have another online uh, copy there. And then we're using Glacier. So any given collection will have either a primary copy uh, at SDSC and then a secondary copy in Wasabi and the third will be Glacier, uh, or the primary copy will be in S3 instead. So the audit service that we have, um, or we call it audit fixie checking service. Um, it is a Java application that's running on, uh, right now running on a couple of different servers uh, concurrently. And um, it cycles through objects as tracked by the inventory database, that's um, a separate service. So it interfaces with that service to basically, you know, as as it runs through the entire um, uh, corpus, it will go to the database and um, you know find out what it needs to work on next. And we can distribute this work across the different um, the different servers that are running audit. Uh, so. You know, we've got, we have this, we have 53 million files times three. However, um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, you really can't count the Glacier copies because we're not doing, you know, um, fix the checking in that true sense um, in our Glacier copies either. We are doing a little bit of something which I'll explain um, in another minute or two uh, by ch checking just some metadata, but it's by all means, we're not pulling content or doing anything else, so. Um, Andrew, I, I think when when you had replied to that post uh, about Fixity a couple of weeks ago um, in the curation, uh, uh, it was, uh, was it the preservation or digital curation, or it was a it was a Google group, right? Yeah, digital curation, I think. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We pretty much um, had the same same kind of reply there. Um, so you know, it's, it's like one of those things where, you know, you can take a look at some metadata and that's it. Um, but um, one of the things we, you know, we do want to try to do, which we're not doing right now, though, is to run through the entire corpus in every, every 90 days. Um, and I'll talk about that and the challenges associated with that in a minute. Um, just to, you know, also similarly, um, you know, with with S3 and with Glacier and with Wasabi, you know, it's it's like we have to think about this in terms of how do we pair 
our fixity checking like standalone service with the durability that they are, um, you know, are, are basically putting out there um, with, you know, 11 nines of durability in any kind of, in any given year. Um, we, I think it was last year in the same interest group meeting, we did have Wasabi come and talk about their service um, and from there uh, it was probably one of the first times I heard that they're doing integrity uh, testing as well every 90 days. Um, with STSC down in San Diego um, they have uh, three copies across multiple nodes in their storage clusters and they take nightly snapshots and of course they're they're cognizant of, of you know impending like hardware failures and things like that. Um, so I think one of the, the key things here with regard to how our audit service works across the different cloud providers is that they all have S3 compatible APIs. Um, without that compatibility, we would be writing <laughs> unique routines and a unique Im implementation for each different um, uh, storage provider. So uh, Wasabi has been great in terms of its S3 compatible API functionality. Um, it's, you know, of course, with Glacier and um, that's either there. And the SDSC, the Cumulo storage, also has that same exact compatibility as a layer on top of it. Uh, so in, in general, um, what we're doing is actually downloading an object uh, to local storage on one of the um, EC2 instances up in Oregon. Um, we're running a calculation on it and then checking the digest against the central database or the inventory database. And then we end up updating uh, just that database to say, yes, this object's been audited and moving on to the next one. Uh, I just wanna check on the time real quick. So the challenges here um, with Glacier are the same. And so really, you know, what we're, the only thing we're, we're able to do is to um, is to write a little bit of metadata uh, that gets stored in the Glacier Vault. So, in other words, when you first write uh, content to Glacier, it sits in an S3 bucket for a little while. Um, we can always calculate uh, a checksum there uh, and then store that result, or the, we can store the digest. Um, ultimately, that metadata, the digest, is stored. Um, and it migrates uh, as well into the Glacier Vault. So if we want to at least get a hold of what that digest looks like, um, we can query it and receive it via the header information um, and then match that up to what's in our database. Um, so it's really, it's not fixity checking. It is just literally saying, is the object still there? So looking forward, um, you know, what can we really do to uh, get down to that, to that particular target? And oh, I skipped a slide, my bad. For some reason, Google Slides skipped it for me. So this is a really, I think this has been the most challenging thing for us lately. Um, our database is an RDS instance uh, uh, provided by, by Amazon. And this instance, it's, it's a very large database the instance itself is, um, it's, it's a pretty uh, well-resourced instance, uh, has a lot of like credits associated with it, a lot of processing power associated with it. However, it's very easy for us to overwhelm the number of allowable like IO, like reads and writes to and from the database with our audit applications, especially if they're running on four different servers. Um, We've hit the road basically like a, a wall uh, very recently where if we have four audit servers running, we will max out these credits, um, what, what are called burst credits uh, for getting to the database. Um, so the way the implementation is right now, we have to, it's not only about reading that database, but when something is, um, has, you know, a check has been completed, we're writing back to the database and we're also updating the index on that table. Um, which is which gets a little more costly. So, um, what will happen is if we if we you know run through all of these credits, 
then Amazon throttles back that RDS instance and the system as a whole literally just comes to a crawl. Like any of the microservices trying to get through the inventory database are, are you know, hitting this problem where there are no more, there's, there's basically not a lot of bandwidth left. Um, so we've kind of tuned our audit servers back a little bit. We've decreased the number of threads they run on. Um, we have fewer of them. Um, but this is a problem that we, we really need to kind of solve either through a new implementation uh, or literally purchasing more credits in a larger RDS instance, which is going to get expensive. And yeah, we've got a lot to talk about there. Um, so what else can we do? Because uh, right now we're not at that 90 day target of auditing everything. We're at more like five months um, and we really need to get back down to 90 days. And I think a big part of that is because we brought the Wasabi copies online um, and we can't run as many audit servers as we want to. Um, so a lot of the transactions are happening just to check the Glacier content, to check those digests. Um, and because that's not true fixity, um, we're thinking about, well, what can we do there to actually kind of decrease the number of transactions related to, to Glacier content and save some of those credits. Um, of course, increasing the credits by paying more money, um, prioritizing objects by size when it comes to audit. Uh, we're queuing them also. Um, that's something else we're going to be looking into. And I mean, historically, the database schema in Merit has been really stable and, and robust. Um, but that, you know, that's also something we can try to change in terms of indexing or creating new tables or otherwise uh, that might help us in this particular cause. Um, and then the last thing there, uh, dynamically scaling the number of audit hosts, either up or down, depending on what's going on. Um, we already have some automation in place for deploying the application to new hosts um, and a little bit of, and some configuration management that's happening there, um, which is great, but you know, we need to kind of get our credits, uh, credit usage under control um, before we can go that direction. So, the last last bit here, because um, I think we, yeah, we're at 1249. Um, just a couple of questions that we've already kind of, one of them we've already gone through. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think both of these are out there and in people's minds. But I did want to mention these couple of resources here that I can also supply the links to. Uh, something that came out really recently um, through the Digital Preservation Coalition, um, which I think, I, well, I'm not sure if other folks have seen this, but it looks really interesting to me. Which checksum algorithm should I use? It's a white paper that just got put out there. And then I'm always checking David Rosenthal's blog um, about some of the new stuff he's got posted every once in a while. But yeah, a couple of good resources. And let me stop sharing. Okay, so um, I think we could probably since Leah still needs some time to chat, um, yeah, why don't we save questions until after? Does that sound okay, Leah? Sure. Okay. Uh, right. I should I should be able to go pretty quickly. Um, for those of you who've been on the group for a while, I did uh, last February we did a whole session on authentication in the cloud um, with uh, Zeph Delgadillo from from Google. So I'm not going to go through all of that again because you can go back to the February YouTube video. Uh, if you want to see more information about that. But basically, Zeph wrote some functions and it was based on what our needs were at Georgetown Law, which is not a huge uh, service provider. We're just who we are. And the university had decided uh, to go with Google in terms of cloud storage. So that was dictated to us. Um, and we were bagging. So bag it was what I had sent to the, to the engineers. Uh, as uh, part of what we did to try to explain to them uh, what our needs were. And uh, Google just uses MD5. We were using SHA-1 at the time, so we had to go back and create MD5 algorithms uh, or checksums in addition to our SHA-1. So that was something that we had to do based on what their uh, capabilities were. But 
because it's just us, um, the idea of utilizing the metadata that Google's already creating and that includes uh, fix the information isn't really a problem. Um, I can understand that, Andrew, when you were talking about, you know, the need to be able to tell a client, you know, this fixity was run yesterday. Uh, we can't really do that. We can, it's sort of backwards of that. We, we can know when something has happened. The Google functions will bring out um, dates when something was added, dates when something was deleted, dates when something was changed. If there's an actual change in the file, there'll be a note for that. So basically what this system does is pull uh, that metadata and compile it so that we can use it. So uh, it's not running the fixity when we're telling it to run the fixity, it's running the fixity when it runs the fixity, but it's telling us what might have changed uh, in those fixity checks. And the part that I just wanted to mention, so this is the kind of information that we can pull. Uh, that's just the manifest. And then this is, you know, for instance, here's file created, file deleted, file created. This was something that the person obviously redid it right one right after another. So that's the kind of information that we can get. But the anecdote that I want to talk about is um, has to do with cost. I know people have a lot of interest in how the cost is figured in any of these cloud storage processes. And we had a point where our director, before she was willing to commit to doing this, she needed to have a uh, cost estimate. And we sat down with the Google engineers and they had a really difficult time just trying to figure out what things were gonna cost. This uses BigQuery, this uses, this uses several pieces of the Google uh, universe and each has a different cost. And as Andrew was saying, some of it's measured in milliseconds. And so it was really tricky. Uh, we came up with a cost of about 200 for what we have, which is about 40 terabytes, uh, about $250 a month for us. So we started working on that. The pandemic happened and we're furiously adding things into Google Cloud Storage while we could. And one thing that happened, which was a combination of, this was a new process that they had developed and it was a process that I, you know, I don't totally un know how the functions work. I, I didn't build it. And as a, as a result of that, there was a disconnect in terms of uh, every time you ingest something new, it runs through the processes for absolutely everything in, in the whole uh, bucket. So all of those tiny little costs became huge costs. And for the month of April last year, instead of having the, the 200 to $250 cost, we had about a through almost $5,000 cost. So I can show you the, so this was our graph and you can see what happened there. That obviously that big spike was the thousands of dollars of cost, which to Google's credit, when I contacted them and asked them what happened and they looked into it and they realized that it was uh, multiplying uh, the functions every time we ingested something, they, they refunded us that, that uh, money. So that was, uh, very nice on their part, but I wanted to just tell this little anecdote so that people are aware of some of the pitfalls that can happen when you're trying to uh, develop these new solutions for fixity with, you know, with cloud providers, because it is a very black box kind of process uh, a lot of the time. I think uh, I, I was very happy working with the engineer from Google that I had, and he, I think, was as transparent as he could possibly be didn't feel like there was any attempt to try to uh, keep information from us, but there are still definite pitfalls. So that's my little anecdote on our Google in the cloud. And of course, with the past year, oh, I, what I didn't show you was um, one of the things that we decided was instead of having this run uh, on, a, on its own schedule um, and having it on all the time, which is if it had not been these functions had been not been turned on the entire time, that would not have happened. And even though they have fixed the code so that that won't happen again, I now run this manually, which of course, because it's just us, uh, I can do that. So, you know, I have a uh, cloud scheduler and I just go in and you know click the box and then click run now. And so it has become again, something that I used to use 
Fixity when we had our campus had its own storage. I would run the Fixity uh, program from uh, AVP and had to remember to do that once a month. When this came up, I was like, oh, okay, I don't have to remember to do this, but I'm back to needing to remember to do this once a month, just, just so that I don't run into that kind of situation again. All right, thanks, Leah. All right, so we have just a few more minutes left. Um, I wanted to ask if folks had any other questions for Andrew or Leah or myself. Um, do you wanna put them out there in the chat? So Andrew mentioned, you know, kind of like catching unexpected problems. And I'm wondering, are there any other kinds of automated tests that you've imagined running that would catch things that Fixity check wouldn't catch? I'm thinking about, you know, can you track file additions, file deletions in a way that could create like a different type of audit thread? Are, are you asking me that question? I'm kind of asking everybody that question. But if, if you've thought about it, I it, just that was prompting me to think, what else, what else could we do besides fixity checks to try to? Um, OK, well, there was a case. And actually, I think you were at Georgetown when this happened, where some files from Georgetown didn't get stored correctly in S3. They got stored as zero byte files. Um, we had to go through and figure out what was affected. So I wrote a Python script to basically um, give me the name, size, and um, e tags, and all the other metadata tags of every single item that we have in our, our, in our preservation buckets. And then I'm going to compare that to every single thing we have in our database. And we were able to. Um, identify and then finally fix all of the zero length files, which somehow by your good luck only affected Georgetown. I don't know why no one else got bit by that. But yeah, that that's another, that's more of a one-off audit check and it's very heavyweight because we're basically combing through literally every single thing in preservation, just the, the metadata of it. And then literally combing through every single thing in our registry database and making sure they match up. Um, it's a good exercise. I don't want to go through it again if I don't have to, but. Yeah, thanks. And let's see, um, Lauren just mentioned that uh, Joe Carano wrote a really good blog post about this with Andrew's help. And she added a link there, great. Thanks, Lai. I can add that to the notes. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right, so we are at time. Um, thank you again, Andrew, Leah, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, if you have any kind of follow-up questions or anything, um, do feel free to put them in the notes. We can always follow up afterwards. Um, but uh, uh, I think that should um, that should wrap us up for this month. Um, Leah, do you have anything else you want to add? Just that we're we're looking at various topics for next month. Maybe the environmental impact of digital preservation. It's it's not set, but that's we're looking at a couple different topics for next month. Yeah, yeah, we've got that and. Um, uh, we may be looking into uh, some talks about information security and IS policy. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. Uh, it was great to see you all. And um, we will see you next month, uh, hopefully on Monday the 15th. Thanks again. Take Bye, care. everyone. Bye.